Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm here with Dr. Shazad Salim. He has a PhD in the history of the Quran from the University of Wales. He's also a student of the renowned scholar Javed Ghamadi, and he is a fellow with Al Maurid Institute. Dr. Shazad Salim, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's wonderful to have you here. Dr. Shazad, I want to start you off with a, a very difficult verse. <laughs> I want to ask you about the sword verse. This is a verse that is often quoted by non Muslims and also Muslims as mm -hmm. well who wonder, you know, why would God command the Prophet Muhammad to fight people who are non-Muslims? So how do you understand this verse, Dr. Shazad? Yes, indeed, this is one of the most perplexing verses of the Quran. And I think if you read the Quran in, uh, uh, in the background of the Old Testament as well, uh, you'll find out that there is a particular law of the Almighty which uh, runs through divine scriptures. And it's not just the Quran. You'll find the Old Testament and partly the New Testament as well. Uh, describing that there is a practice of the Almighty uh, which is in, is in currency in the era of messengers of God mm -hmm. and which cannot be extended beyond that era. And that particular uh, feature is that God creates lesser days of judgment on the face of the earth in the times of his messengers. Why? Because people living in the post-prophetic era, I mean, uh, era in which uh, we, we are all living, era in which, uh, of course, which began with the departure of Prophet Muhammad, uh, for us, our judgment has been deferred to the day of judgment. Hmm. So in order to remind us that our judgment is going to take place on the day of judgment, but not necessarily in this world, we have been uh, shown through the Quran and the Old and the New Testaments that look in the times of messengers of God, people who intentionally deny the truth, they are punished by the Almighty, just as they would be punished on the day of judgment. So on the day of judgment, the Almighty would punish people who associated partners with him. Uh, he will punish people who uh, might not have associated partners with him, but they were sinners in other ways. So basically what has happened is that that greater day of judgment, which, was to, which is to take place uh, for all of us, is reflected in a, in, a, in a miniature way in the era of every messenger of God, in which it is basically God who takes matters in his own hands and through his messengers, he punishes people who intentionally deny the truth. Now, uh, this is very important to realize that this denial is not out of any confusion, not out of any misunderstanding. It's a deliberate denial. Hmm. So the Almighty says that uh, through his messengers, uh, and these messengers are given special signs, some miracles, some outstanding uh, features. Like, for example, we know what Jesus was given. We know how Moses uh, was dealt with and the way he was able to speak to God, or he tried to speak to God. And... Uh, of course, at the same time, uh, he had uh, the, the audience of the Pharaoh uh, and he was given these signs so that uh, he could talk to the Pharaoh in a particular way. And similarly, Muhammad Sallallahu was given the sign, which is the greatest sign perhaps, the Quran itself, which was to be the last testament. So these messengers of God, uh, they, on, the, on behalf of the Almighty, they deliver the truth, they answer questions regarding God's monotheism, regarding his uh, attributes, regarding some of the questions that have arisen in the minds of people. And this goes on for a particular period of time. And the Almighty says that once the truth is evident to these people, evident to these people in such a way that it is conclusive, they don't have any excuse, it's just arrogance or any other thing that is maybe impeding their acceptance. The Almighty says that now is the time that they should be taken to task and they should be punished because this is going to take place in the same manner on that greater day of judgment. Mm -hmm. So what is happening is that these lesser days of judgments that are set up in the uh, eras of these messengers of God, they are based on this fact that uh, people are intentionally denying. And because of the fact that none of us can know whether a person is uh, deliberately denying or not, because this is something which relates to our heart. Mm -hmm. So it is the Almighty actually who, who divulges this, this information. Mm -hmm. So for example, we find Abraham in the Old Testament when he saw that uh, uh, the angels were visiting the, the Lot's uh, settlement and destroying them. And he said that, Lord, what if 50 people are there? And he said, there are not even 50 people. And so and so forth until, until, the, until the count came to 10. And the Almighty said, it's not even 10. Mm -hmm. So it's basically uh, the Almighty who uh, destroys people because of the, or punishes them because they had become adamant on arrogance, adamant on deliberate denial. And this deliberate denial is something which uh, is, uh, is unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And because of the fact that in, on the day of judgment, according to the Quran, 
people who associate partners with God deliberately, I mean, not out of any confusion, but deliberately, uh, the Almighty says that they will be punished uh, with the worst thing and that this it's like an unforgivable punishment and that is they'll be put to death. So just as they were put to death, or they would be put to death on the day of judgment, similarly in the, in the prophetic era in which messengers, they come on behalf of God, and if after that conclusive communication, they persist on that uh, denial that they still associate partners with God, the verdict of God is that they should be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Because this is a fate that's going to take place uh, for them on the day of judgment. And in order to make it a palpable reality, this is something which the Almighty arranged in the era of messengers of God. And one by one, you see uh, this happen. If you go on, starting with Adam and Noah, for example, is, uh, is a very uh, important uh, personality. Uh, the deluge destroyed his, his uh, people and for 950 years he was there uh, and uh, delivering the message of God. And what, what we can say is that in most messengers of God, this destruction or this punishment of uh, denying the truth took place through these natural calamities. For example, earthquakes, cyclones, uh, tempestuous winds. Uh, and in the era of Prophet Muhammad, uh, because of certain reasons, uh, the Almighty actually empowered the believers that uh, the, the task which was to be carried out or which was carried out in the previous nation's history through our cyclones and, and other natural disasters would now take place through the swords of the believers. So it's like thinking that uh, it's not that the Almighty is, uh, I mean, killing someone for, for any uh, vengeance or, or, or maybe any, any anger. It is basically a punishment of arrogance in which a person is, is persistent in spite of being convinced of the truth. Mm -hmm. And in the in terminology of the Quran, this persistence on denying, in spite of being consist, uh, uh, convinced about it, is called itmam al hujja or the fact that you know what the truth is, but you say that I'm not going to accept it. Mm -hmm. So the punishment that's, that was the fate of these people on the day of judgment is actually shown to us in the era of messengers of God. Having said that, in Prophet Muhammad's own era, this punishment actually was just meted out to a couple of people because almost all of his nation accepted faith. Mm -hmm. So very few people who persisted on that denial, they became active adversaries. Uh, they were guilty of breach of contract as well. They were guilty of even plotting to kill Prophet Muhammad. Were, and they, you can count them on your fingers, four or five of them. Otherwise, it was just a potential directive which never took place. Mm -hmm. One so, more so Dr. Sad, like mm -hmm. I, I've been reading some scholars on, on this subject and many of them try to limit the prescription in the verse. Like they'll mm -hmm. try to say, for example, that, you know, these weren't just polytheists, right? Mm -hmm. These weren't just people who disbelieved in God, but they had political motives, right? Mm -hmm. They were working against the Prophet Muhammad. They were breaching the contracts that mm -hmm. they were already made. Right. Um, they were trying to drive out the Muslims from mm -hmm. their home. They were um, trying to get mm -hmm. people to align against mm -hmm. the Prophet Muhammad. So working politically against him. Uh -huh. So it wasn't just that they weren't, were disbelieving or like they had, they had access to mm -hmm. the faith and they mm -hmm. disbelieved in it. Mm -hmm. How would you respond so to those I, I would say claims? this is actually the opposite. The basic uh, sin or crime that they committed was that denial. Mm. And the Quran actually refers to it by words such as mimbaadima tabayyana lahumul haq, which means that kafaru bima, and they denied after the truth became evident to them. They denied after they fully acknowledged what the truth was. In addition to that, they became active adversaries as well. They, they were guilty of breach of contract. But the basic uh, crime that they committed was to deny a prophet of God, not out of any confusion. And when I say deny a prophet of God, I mean denying his message. Mm. So it was, it was like, like that. And then, uh, as I said, I was also trying to make this distinction that the Quran tells us that uh, polytheists and people who are basically monotheists, there is a difference in the punishment uh, which the Almighty made in, in that prophetic era. And that is that polytheists uh, would deserve no lenience because they associate partners with God and uh, they would be not treated with any lenience on the day of judgment. So a very similar fate would be here. But as far as the people of the book are concerned, uh, for them, because of the fact that they are primarily monotheists, they may be deviant monotheists, but they are not polytheists. Mm. So that is why in the whole corpus of the Quran, there is not a single place, and I say this with complete responsibility, that there is not a single place which tells us that Christians are polytheists, hmm. in spite of the fact that they indulge in polytheism. Why? Because they themselves do not concede to polytheism. They say, well, this is monotheism, and uh, the way they explain Trinity is, is in a way that they think that it's, it's exactly what monotheism is. So at best, what they can be called is that they are deviant monotheists, or they are not 
uh, proper monotheists. So for them, the Almighty relented. And he said that they, for them, the punishment is not going to be the same as the polytheists themselves. For them, the punishment would be that they would just be uh, I mean, allowed to live on their own religion, but they would be made to look subservient by actually paying the jizya tax and living in subservience to the, to the Muslim state. And finally, one more thing that has to be realized is that this practice of the Almighty is specific to the prophetic era mm. because only messengers of God have this prerogative and that too because the Almighty is right behind them. He is using them as his own instruments of justice, just as he was using tempests and cyclones and earthquakes as his instruments of justice to administer punishment. So once Prophet Muhammad passed away uh, in 632 AD, this practice is no longer uh, supposed to take place. So what has happened is that people uh, thinking that because the Prophet's life is the best example that you need to follow, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي يَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْفَةٌ حَسَنًا so they thought that this aspect too is something that they need to follow without realizing that this practice was specific to God's messengers. Hmm. So they ended up extrapolating and extending it to later era. So for example, Mullah Umar, uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, or Osama bin Laden, all, all of them, without exception, they actually uh, quoted and cited these verses of the Quran, فَقْتُلُ mushrikeen or قَاتِلُ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ or قَاتِلُ عَيْمَةُ kufr all which means that you have to put to task all these disbelievers. Uh, without realizing that they are the prerogative of messengers of God. And they said, well, if they did it because of the fact that he's, uh, he's an example for all of us, we are also required to do the same. And so they were uh, inadvertently, I would say, guilty of uh, extrapolating a practice that was meant specifically for messengers of God. And as I said, uh, you can find these examples in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in the Quran itself, uh, to be relating to this era only. Mm -hmm. So they extended it to later parts and uh, to later periods, and they now have the same, same behavior. So, for example, verses like, don't befriend uh, uh, the disbelievers, like, لا تتخذ الجهود والنصارى أولياء, or, for example, uh, for example, in Hadith literature, we have that you should not pay salutations to non-Muslims, that you should mm -hmm. not, not initiate. So all these uh, sort of harsh directives in our Hadith and in, in the Quran, they all relate to the non-Muslims or the Christians and Jews of the era of Prophet Muhammad. They are, so Dr. They, Shazad, how can, how can we tell that? Like, how can yeah, we... That's a brilliant you know, question. Is it just like we kind of decide that, no, you know, no. there are some verses so, that seem so you see, like, like you they see, fit the that You see, the Quran itself makes it very clear. It says, مَا كُنَّا مُعَزَّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَسَ رَسُولَ Which means that this, this punishment is, is something which only God's messenger is allowed to take. Uh, is allowed to take. For example, the primary verse in the Quran is in Surah Yunus, which says that... Uh, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولٍ For every nation there is a messenger. فَإِذَا جَاءَ رَسُولُهُمْ قُزِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْقِسْتِ So once a messenger of that nation comes, it decides its fate. And then there is no delay in that. So it is always the immediate messengers which, uh, which are the ones who are actually addressed. And one thing that can make it uh, even more palpable, I would say, and uh, absolutely clear is that deliberate denial of a nation or a people is not something that can be done by human judgment. So today, if someone is deliberately denying or not, I cannot be sure of. Hmm. It's only okay. God. And God in the times of uh, his messengers, he actually communicated this to these messengers. Even the messengers themselves were not in a position to decide. So it was he who said through wahi or divine revelation, yes, the time is up for these people. Yes, they are the ones who should, uh, uh, who should actually now be taken to task. And you might be remembering that in, in the Quran also and in the, the Old Testament, the prophet Jonah, he left his nation much earlier. He thought that he has done his duty mm -hmm. and the Almighty actually punished him and said, well, not this is, this is the, the fact whether a nation has come to that point is an information which I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Why did you leave without my permission? So you see, this is a prerogative which is only conveyed to God's uh, wahi, I would say. And because of the institution of wahi has ended, uh, it no longer takes place and no longer messages are uh, uh, come. So we can clearly see that this is a practice that cannot be extended because I cannot claim that I've been given this message by God to, uh, and I've, I'm in a position like a messenger of God uh, to convey the truth in this ultimate form. And I am receiving this message from God that yes, the time is up for such people. Mm -hmm. So basically what has happened is that a practice that was specific to God's messengers era uh, because of the fact that God's messengers were in a position to, to disseminate the truth in that ultimate way, and because it was God who was telling them that the time had finished for such and such people, mm -hmm. that it was actually made possible. Mm -hmm. In the post-prophetic era, 
of course neither we have messengers of god nor we have god's communication so even if today people are intentionally denying we cannot pinpoint them out mm -hmm. so all that we need to do is have to make friends with them we have to be very very uh, friendly very very courteous to them and deal with them as if they are own their own brethren i think uh, after 911 has taken place this is the greatest uh, opportunity for us mm -hmm. to actually tell them that we belong to the same fraternity all of us belong to the same fraternity of being the nations of messengers of god and the quran is very explicit it says that all the messengers of god they brought the same message so basic religion for all these messengers is exactly the same so if no moses or noah or jesus uh, had a particular message the quran is absolutely not different from mm -hmm. that on the only difference that we find in the quran today is that it is uh, preserved in its original language otherwise i uh, i do teach the bible to my students almost every week i make it a point to tell them that it is absolutely uh, of paramount importance to you start reading the bible start reading the old testament and new testament the psalms and read it in uh, with, with the quran together because basically they are from the same source and uh, you'll find exactly what i have just discussed regarding this law being being featured in the old testament as well we find moses being faced in the exactly the same situation in which, which he was required to uh, punish people for example uh, when they took to idolatry and uh, similarly we have uh, other examples in which uh, uh, as i said uh, natural disasters were responsible for destroying nations of god so it's basically studying the scriptural history and you'll find this practice of god uh, being described there but it cannot be extended beyond the prophetic era beyond, beyond that and that is what has actually happened mm -hmm. so instead of realizing it that it was supposed to stop right after prophet muhammad so jizya is something which is still being imposed or de facto people still think that if you conquer non muslims then you'll impose jizya and then again we have this notion that the that the responsibility of every uh, muslim state is to basically conquer the globe i mean it's like a global uh, conquest mm -hmm. and the rest to be to live in, in in subservience without realizing that the jihad which took place by the sahaba uh which we know that they conquered persia they they conquered byzantium it was all under the same law in which the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had done that initial work the truth had been conveyed and convinced uh, i mean they were convinced of the truth and they still denied it and it was basically a punishment of not accepting the truth in spite of being convinced about it mm -hmm. so it was not the it was not that islam was being spread by the sword so to speak and it was not like subjugating people in the name of islam it was basically a reflection of the day of judgment i mean this is of paramount importance to realize that the biggest thing that we uh, people need to understand is that we are going to be held accountable on the day of judgment and because we tend to forget this more often so god has made this arrangement in the quran to tell us that look what happened to these people they were held accountable in this world don't forget your accountability is going to come yet it has been deferred mm -hmm. so this is why the quran has made it so such a palpable reality so that we whenever we read the quran we revisit the quran we find out that this this uh, whole incident or this whole anecdote has been preserved beautifully in the quran and this was something which took place without exception in the lives of every messenger of god hmm. so you mentioned osama bin laden and mullah omar but you know ordinary muslims can make this mistake too right they can they can they look can. at a verse and say okay well mm -hmm. the quran applies for mm -hmm. all times so Absolutely. therefore you know how can you say that certain verses are mm -hmm. limited to a particular circumstance so uh, dr shazad would you recommend that a person look to scholars to see what they've said of, about specific verses uh, because of the fact that this particular law has been divulged and i would say uh, discovered i would say uh, by ustaz hamidun farahi so uh, i mean the rest of the umma the way they view uh, this law is that it is still still applicable so therefore today also if you conquer uh other lands we will enslave women mm -hmm. similarly would be uh, uh we would not give them a chance uh yes there is a distinction that uh, they might not be killed but they will be uh, they will be in our uh, they will be subjugated in, in, in the name of islam and jizya would be imposed on them so because of the fact that uh, almost everyone believes in this so i would say this is something which uh, the farai school or the farai scholars have brought to light uh in a in a very in a emphatic manner so in uh, after understanding their their stance i have written a very short uh book which is called uh, introducing the quran uh, insights from the farai school something like that so basically the, it builds the perspective that before you enter the quran 
because as soon as you'll enter, you'll find these verses mm -hmm. from yes. all sides. Yes. So you need to have a background. You need to have a uh, have this this uh, preamble that this is the book, what it talks about, how it is related to the Old Testament. And you see, when I when we study the Quran. Uh, every single one of us, the, the way we have been taught the Quran is that we have to read the Old and the New Testament in parallel. Okay. Uh, because they are the same books, I mean, they are from the same source, and they describe this law in, in a very similar way. So uh, they, we make it a point to not only equip ourselves with the Bible, uh, which I, of course, refer to the, both the Old and the New Testaments, but also to pass it on to our own students. So the book that I've written, which says Introducing the Quran, uh, actually outlines this practice much before you enter the Quran so that when a person is given a text of the Quran, he could be a non-Muslim, he could be even a Muslim, he knows that what exactly is the background and how do we actually find out whether a certain verse is specific. Although it's, I mean, once Ustaz Farahi has, uh, has pointed that, it becomes very apparent. Mm -hmm. But it takes a person of his stature or uh, people like him that uh, it, it's something that's so simple at times that you tend to ignore it. Mm. So once the thing has been divulged, it becomes very easy. So you just pinpoint those verses which tell us that this is something which is solely related to messengers of God. And it is God's practice to demonstrate that last judgment in a miniature way on, on, on the face of this earth so that we living in this uh, post-prophetic era, we don't tend to forget that our, response, our accountability is, is to come. Maybe not in this world, but yes, on the Day of Judgment. Very interesting insights. Thank you for that, Dr. Shazad. Okay, it's my pleasure. On behalf of Let the Quran Speak, I want to say thank you. You've helped us become the most widely watched Muslim TV show in Canada. I want to appeal to you to continue to support us. You can visit our website, quranspeaks.com. We also accept e-transfers to iGive at quranspeaks.com. And we're now on Patreon, so you can make a monthly contribution. May God bless you and your loved ones today and always.